Amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. Welcome to Shine. Thank you, Pastor Rob. Uh, we are in the middle, well, in the middle, I guess we're starting. This is week two of our uh, new series here for 2020 called Seeing Clearly 2020. And as Pastor Dan mentioned last week, we know no other church is doing this. We feel like God's given us a unique pairing 2020 vision with God's vision. Pretty clever, huh? Anyway, so uh, this series is called 2020, but we truly do believe that God wants to speak to us as his people and give us uh, just his supernatural ability to see through his eyes this year and to live this year to the very fullest. And so we're delighted that you're here. Last week, um, Pastor Dan kicked it off with uh, faith and just what an incredible foundation to seeing clearly is living by faith, not by sight. If you didn't hear that message, I want to encourage you to go back to our Facebook page. You can listen to it or watch it that way, but it is finished. And I'm actually going to be referring, you're going to, we're going to see how this week's message actually feeds off of and, and kind of grows from what we heard and learned last week. So if you didn't catch that, make sure to go back to that. But this week, I am so excited to speak about a topic, a uh, very powerful topic that is one that has been uh, written about by philosophers. It is one that uh, bands and musicians have attempted to capture through their songs. It is one that poets have uh, mused over and, and, and composed numerous volumes of, of literature on. And that is simply this. It's really the power of love, the power of love. Um, I told the, the, the formation, I'm like, I don't know if you guys needed that. I just needed that. You know, sometimes as a speaker, you're just like, I just need to hear that. <laughs> they can't be going. <laughs> but I think we all agree, love is a powerful thing. Love is something that is a, it's a big idea. It's a big idea in our lives. It's a big idea in the world. Again, you don't even have to be a Christian to be writing songs about it. Um, it's a big idea to God right? Um, when we look at Matthew 22, they came to Jesus and they asked him, teacher, rabbi, what is the greatest commandment? If you want to pull that verse up real quick. Um, and he simply turned to them and said, hey, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And, okay, let me uh, backtrack. Okay, you can skip to the next one. They asked him, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, to love the Lord your God. He answered with that word, love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Again, heart, soul, and mind. He's talking about our emotions. He's talking about our, our, our affections. He's talking about our hopes and dreams. He's talking about our thoughts. He's talking, right? Do you see that there? Just heart, soul, mind. I mean, kind of all of us, right? Inside out. And then he kind of adds. He gives them a twofer. Two for one. They didn't really ask him. <laughs> what are the top two? But he's like, and the second <laughs> is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Can you believe that? Jesus says all of the stuff that you guys have been trying to put into practice for literally millennia, not just centuries, but thousands of years, really hinges on these two very simple, not always easy to do, right? But simple things. Love the Lord your God with, with everything inside of you. Love your neighbor as yourself. What about this? Uh, we know from John 13 that we as followers of Jesus are to be known by our love. If you want to pull John 13 up, it says, a new command I give you. Jesus was telling his disciples on the last night before he was crucified. Love one another as I have loved you. Think about this because it's a little, can be a little overwhelming. Think about how much Jesus has loved us. As I have loved you, so you must love one another by this by what this how we love one another right by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another so we know man jesus said it's the biggest thing to god right we heard that matthew 22 
Jesus also said, hey, I want everybody to know, I want this to be the defining characteristic of, of you guys as the family of God, as my people in the world. What's going to turn their heads? What's going to capture their attention? What's going to be different? We can do a lot of stuff. It's great. We can have big events. We can have concerts. We can do all kinds of amazing things. But in the end, what's going to say, what, what is that? That's different. That's fresh. That's new. What is that? It's if we love one another. Now, when we talk about loving, you know, if we look at Scripture, a lot of times as you're preparing to teach or something, you know, we'll be like, well, okay, who in Scripture can we talk about that really understood this? Who, who modeled this? Who exemplified this? And I think you're already kind of knowing where I'm, where I'm going with this. It wasn't a tough decision on this particular point. If I said, Dan, who in the Bible do you think, Dan, Pastor Dan, modeled and lived love to the fullest? Jesus, right? We feel like, would you guys agree with that answer? I know it might be like a Sunday school class where, you know, they ask, what's small and brown, has a bushy tail, eats nuts, jumps from tree to tree? And the little boy's like, I know the answer should be Jesus or God, but sure sounds like a squirrel to me, you know. <laughs> In this case, you actually are safe saying it's Jesus, right? Jesus is the one. First John chapter 4 tells us this. Uh, excuse me. First uh, John chapter 3, 16. It says, this is how we know. Say, this is how we know. If we're really looking to see what, what does love look like? I mean, who models it? Who, who, who is qualified to teach us? This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So not hard. I think we all agree. I don't think we have to spend any more time on this. It's important to God. God wants us to be really identified and known by it and something that sets us apart from the world. And I believe we all agree, Jesus is the one that led the way. He didn't just say, go try to do these things. He just came and said, hey, let me roll up my sleeves. Let me jump into the pit with you and let me love you. Let me truly show you, not just tell you about the love of God. Let me be the love of God to you. Let me show you. And we find countless people in scripture that Jesus loved. Jesus forgave. Jesus met with even one-on-one -on -one, the woman at the well Nicodemus the religious man who was ashamed to meet with him during the daytime he met with him at night and just listened to him and talked to him about being born again and what it means to, to truly be part of of the kingdom of God and so I think all of us would agree Jesus nailed it right but I think when it comes to the question of here and now for us in 2020 and we're like how do we see clearly how do we walk okay we want to do it it's important to God we get it we want to follow Jesus he nailed it but a lot of times I think we feel like these people that um, saw some things on Pinterest that they wanted to copy. Rylan, if you can pull up the first one of those pictures. This is what was on Pinterest here, and then this is what the person did. You see the little, I don't know, you can't barely read at the bottom, but nailed it, right? <laughs> go ahead and go to the next one. There's brown sugar pecan bears. The legs are a little bit beefier, but okay. What about the next one? <laughs> This is what it was supposed to look like, rubber duckies. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Go ahead and show the last one. Supposed to be like the cool little hedgehog. Kind of looks like a creepy Halloween figure there. <laughs> Again, nailed it, right? I think as we, if you're like me, we look at the life of Jesus, we look at someone who's living love, and I feel like those bakers. Like, um... I'm not sure what I'm doing differently here. <laughs> Let me look at those instructions again. Because sometimes my life doesn't look very much at all like what I see Jesus living. And it can be overwhelming, right? It can be like, God, whew, you know, like, or we might see somebody, you know, my dad was somebody who really was a loving person and just super gracious and forgiving. And I think I turned out a little bit more like my mom, you know, just, <laughs> I love you, mom. <laughs> You're loving too. <laughs> just in a feistier way. Um, you know, but we look at people that maybe model love, and it's like, how, how do they do that? I don't know. It's hard, right? It's hard to love. I believe that God wants us to look at today just a, like a couple of things that Jesus understood and that Jesus did that I believe God wants us to be able to understand and us to be able to, to live out that will actually help us be released to love freely, to live a life of love. You ready to jump in and do that? Okay. The first one is I believe that God wants us to get with it. God wants you and me to get with it. 
And it's not what you think, but I'm going to come back to it at the end of what that phrase means. Um, back in October of last year, uh, my wife and I were able to do something really, really special and really memorable. Um, and that was we were able to get a little Airbnb, uh, a little three-story place in uh, Newport Beach. And we were able to, for, for various reasons, not all of our kids, we have three boys and a girl. The, the oldest two are married. Uh, the oldest has a, a, a child, a son, or grandson. Um, then Levi is engaged, and he's getting married. He's probably be here later. Uh, he's getting married in May. And then our 17-year-old daughter, Eliana. And for various reasons, they weren't all going to be with us either at Thanksgiving or at Christmas. So it just worked out where in the beginning of October, everybody was able to fly. And we're like, hey, if you can get yourselves here, we've got the lodging covered. We'll try to help, you know, take care of most of the food and all that kind of stuff. And so everybody flew in. And um, if you want to pull up that picture real quick, Rylan, um, of just this. Oh, no, not that picture. No, that's, on, who is that guy with the balding hair? And cool, not that one. Just messing with you. That's us there at Newport uh, Beach. And then pull up the next one, which is a terrible, terrible picture, but um, you can't even see it, and it looks like we have glowing demon eyes. But <laughs> the reason I pull that up is because we're all sitting on the couch in the Airbnb, and you know you're getting older when all you care about is just hanging with your kids. Anybody in the room? Like, it doesn't matter. The money doesn't matter. The cost doesn't matter. You're like, if I can be with my kids, if I can just be with them, that is the most special thing in life, other than, of course, Jesus and loving him and honoring him. But, but there's just something. I don't know. It's, I didn't try to, like, become, you know, oh, let me be more like that old father, grandfather guy, you know. It just happens. I don't know how it happens, but it just happens that you just want to be with your kids. And I remember sitting there in that living room and just being like, this is so great. This is so good. We were able to go to Disneyland for a day. We were able to go to the beach. We were like a block and a half away. And in October, it was, you know, 70s weather. And it was so sweet and so special. And I believe that there's something there that God wants us to understand he wants us to get with it. Here's the thing. I read a book uh, in the last couple of weeks called With. It's simply called With, and it's written by a guy named Sky Jathani. If you want to pull up the slide of, of that book, in case any of you want to read it, I do recommend the book. I don't agree with every little thing in it, but, uh, but I think overall it's, a, it's an incredibly helpful, uh, maybe thought-provoking book that can really, really set you free. In that book, he talks about four paradigms that oftentimes we live from, maybe without even knowing it, in terms of how we relate to God. And he says oftentimes, and even other religions in the world, if you want to get all philosophical about it, you can even look at other religions and say they probably fit under one or more of, of these four paradigms. And the first one is under God. He says a lot of us live under God, kind of like I'm a sinner. God is a righteous judge, and, and I'm under, and I'm just trying to kind of like negotiate, you know, okay, how can I kind of get out of the trouble that I'm in and hopefully earn some brownie points and try to like whatever. Other, another uh, paradigm is over God where he says that we'll, we'll approach scripture or God's word and, and really kind of set ourselves above it. Like, I don't want to be told how to live, but I just want to kind of pick and choose cafeteria style from God's principles. Oh, success principle. Oh, a marriage principle. Oh, a parenting principle. Oh, a, you know, how to get a wife principle or a husband. You know, oh, and so we set ourselves kind of above it, just sort of making ourselves, if you will, the managers of God's promises and his will. The third paradigm is we live from God, and that is we kind of see ourselves as consumers, right? We're just enjoying the blessings of God, the provision of God, and all that. And so we're just kind of seeing ourselves as consumers. And here's the thing. Um, I want you to know, well, okay. The fourth one is for God. We live for God. And this one can be, ooh, baby. Oh, man. This one can be the one that really infiltrates the church and infiltrates our minds as pastors. Because I know, I'm going to be real with you guys, I have fallen into living and letting that paradigm be my central paradigm, even when it comes to thinking about you and, and others. In, in, in how do we get people off the, you know, uh, off of their hind ends and really, really get them involved in the church, really get them excited, get them serving in the nursery, get them, get them sharing their faith, get them, you know, loving each other, getting, come on, out of the bathroom and back into the greeting time, giving high fives, sharing the love. 
you know, and it's all about getting people oftentimes in that, uh, if, if we all, oftentimes as pastors fall into, like, if I can get people from living from God to living for God, you know what I'm saying? Doing stuff for God, giving to missions, taking a mission trip, serving in the coffee bar, serving, doing, four, four, four. Now, I want to make it very clear. I don't think he's saying, I, I truly don't, and I, and I certainly am not saying, these are not elements of our walk with God. I believe we are under God. He is the sovereign king. He is the righteous judge. I believe we can live, you know, uh, well, I don't know if over, but I think he washed the disciples' feet. He makes us feel like he's, right? He loves serving us. There's a reality to that. I think we can live from his favor. How many of you guys are thankful for that? That we, wow, whoo, glory, right? We live from, we don't have to worry about, am I adopted? Am I loved? Am I forgiven? Am I accepted in him? Now we live from that. Absolutely we do. And then are there times when he's like calling us to, to maybe do things for him or step out? Absolutely. But here's what, even one of these books defines idolatry as a good thing becoming the ultimate thing. A good thing becoming the ultimate thing. When any of these four paradigms replace my walk with God, and his passionate interest and obsession with having a relationship with me, then things are out of whack and out of alignment and out of balance. And all of a sudden, before we know it, we start spinning out and we end up wondering why we're dry, why we're frustrated, why it's not fulfilling, why we're telling people, oh man, yeah, you should come to Jesus because you know, he'll fill your life with peace and joy. And well, That sure sounds good. <laughs> I could use some of that. And we really feel like we're cheesy salesmen or women. Anybody felt that? I believe that God is saying, I'm calling you to get with, get. I want you to understand. I want you to get with. And it might not be it, it might be me. Get with me. Understand the value. Let me give you a couple verses. And then we'll have a chance to, to just, I'm going to ask, just let you know, I'm going to ask a couple of you uh, to share if you've struggled with one of these paradigms or if you've been in an environment that maybe that was overly emphasized or, or we're not trying to criticize other places or, or this, you know, we're not trying to be critical, but we're trying to, to say, how have we seen that kind of try to infiltrate and take the place of with? Does that make sense? So be thinking about that, but I'm gonna give you a couple verses here real quick. Uh, John 1, 1 and 2, the beginning of the Gospel of John says this, in the beginning was the word, who's that speaking of? Jesus, in the beginning was the word and the word was what? What? With. with God, and the word was God. He was, didn't we already say that? He was with God in the beginning. Do you think that possibly if the Holy Spirit inspiring the writer of a gospel has him repeat something he just said like 20 words earlier? Maybe there's a reason for that. Why do we need to hear with twice? Into, he already said it. But it says he was with God. He was God. He was with God. <laughs> I believe it's telling us God is a relational God. The Father and the Son love each other. They love hanging out together with one another. And of course, the Holy Spirit as well. What about this scripture? Matthew 1, when Gabriel is appearing, I believe, uh, to Mary and, and, and prophesying about the birth of the Messiah, it says, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is... God is with. with us. God is with us. There's somebody who got this, I believe a couple of people in the Bible that I want us to look at real quick. The first one is Moses. You know, God used him to mightily set his people free from slavery, from Egypt. He gets him after, uh, well, he spent 40 years uh, in the palace as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, being trained in all the Egyptian ways of royalty and, and uh, getting prepared to, to rule and reign. He tried to solve the problem with his own idea, right? And, and tried to fight injustice in his own way and with his own strength. Ended up killing an Egyptian, being chased out of Egypt. Spent the next 40 years on the backside of the desert, in Midian, I don't know, maybe you feel that way. Like, whoa, I think I made a decision that derailed my purpose, derailed my destiny. I believe God wants you to know it's never too late. It's never too late for him to use you. It's never too late to choose the path of his love and of his purpose in your life. Moses was 80 years old. How many times could the enemy have beat him up with, you're done. Man, if you hadn't committed that murder, maybe God would be able to use you, but pfft. You think God's going to want to use you now, a murderer? 
But here he's 80 and he sees a bush that is burning but is not consumed. And he hears God say, Moses, turn aside. Take your shoes off. This is holy ground. I'm not done with you. Are you willing to follow me? I've got a purpose and a destiny for you to fulfill. And he followed God. So after that happened, the 10 plagues, God shows off his incredible power, brings his people out into the desert. God, Moses is leading millions of people out in the desert. He's probably drawing on the, the preparation that he experienced those first 40 years and the second 40 years to lead. But at one point in chapter 33, he says, God, you've told me to take these people basically to the promised land, but... Um, you haven't said who will go with us. And in verse, uh, chapter 33, verse 15, it says this, forgive me, my Bible is being ornery here. Um, it says, if it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. Forgive me, I think I picked up a couple of verses early. Then the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses. I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. He says, this is what sets us apart. It's your presence with us. It's not that we're better at doing righteous deeds than others. It's not that we're holier than others. It's not that we're, it's your presence with us that sets us apart. He defined himself by God with him, and he understood the value of that. One other person I'll share with you, and then we'll discuss this. Another person I love in the scripture, skipping ahead uh, a couple thousand years, is, is John, the youngest disciple, John. When he wrote his gospel, and I believe it was uh, 90 or 95, eight, at the end of the first century there, he wrote his gospel. When you read his gospel, you find something funny. He uses this phrase over and over. And then Jesus asked the disciple whom he loved. Have you noticed that? And who's he talking about? I'm not sure how the other disciples and gospel writers felt. Like, thank you, John, for rubbing salt in that wound. Yes, you got to sit with him closest at the Last Supper and throughout, no doubt, your ministry. Yes, you got to go up with James and, and uh, Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Yes, you were part of the little secret meetings behind closed doors. Yes, 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 John, the one who Jesus loved. Yeah. I'm sure. But here's what I find interesting. Isn't it cool that John, of all the things he could have used to refer to himself, man, I was the closest, this, that, look at, my, God used me to do this, God used me to do that. The thing that he chooses to say, this is what defines me. This is who I am. This literally is taking the place of my name, is the one whom Jesus loved. It's God with me. It's I, I, I am close with Jesus. Isn't that cool? I believe that God is wanting us first and foremost to get with it, but really get with him. I believe Jesus understood the value of that. I believe John understood it as being the closest one. Man, there's no way we can walk lives of love unless we are understanding that God's heart, his father's heart, just like my heart for my kids in Newport, is just to be with us, just to love us. So I want to ask you, let's take a couple minutes here real quick, and we've got a microphone available. Pastor Rob's at the back. Um, when is a time when you felt Jesus reaching out to you just to be with you? Have you felt him pursue you in that way, just as a friend with a friend? Or when is a time that you've experienced struggle maybe with one of those other paradigms of living under God or just for God, picking and choosing or only seeing yourself as a manager of his blessings or maybe just for him trying to do enough good things to make him happy? Who wants to go first? And by the way, if you're new with us, uh, this is Shine, and we, we love to include interaction in our services, and we believe that we, we gain and we learn from hearing, not just from whoever's speaking, but from each other as brothers and sisters. So don't be shy. Even if it's your first time, you're welcome to, to participate. Just raise your hand. Oh, Brandon. Um, this one has to do with the for God part. Um, 
and I think this is really powerful because it's outside of the four walls, right? And like there's there's moments in my life for sure, I'm sure we all have this, where we do something for God and it actually ministers to us more than it would us being in church. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I just would like to encourage everybody, the for God is important too because oftentimes God will meet you in that moment where you talk yes. to that homeless person or you sacrifice something for somebody else or you do something for God. Um, so I just encourage you, don't lose hope for that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Sometimes it's when we're obeying God's call, speaking of faith, when God speaks something to us, we hear him say, hey, let's go bless this person. Let's go love that person. Let's go serve. Sometimes it is, in, you're right, in the, in the doing for, but he's also with, right? Like we're doing it with him. That's a great point, Brandon. Somebody else? Believe back in the... So I grew up in a very um, legalistic, religious background, Mm. and I really um, consider that the for and the under go Mm. really hand in hand. So you feel like you have a thumb that's on you, and so you're doing everything for, 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 and you're trying to please God with everything that you are doing and quite honestly it gets to be exhausting and it wasn't until a moment when I cried out to him in desperation and said what do you want me to do for you that I actually um, sensed the spirit say to me stop trying to do it for me and do it with me mm. um, and that brought a lot of peace yeah. after yeah. like decades hmm. of trying to do the four under yes amen so good somebody else I think Rob overhear this. Rob sees that hand. No, it's more for from God, living from God. Every now and then, sometimes you see that you're in your darkest times, and God will reach out. He'll bring you what you need to continue. Yeah. He'll bring you the hope the light that you're missing in your life yeah. out of nothing when you have nothing yeah. and he did that for me so awesome he brought so me awesome. my wife Amen. Amen. we can <laughs> praise God absolutely let's give him Jesus praise for his faithfulness somebody else Just coming also from a legalistic background initially as a Christian, and um, it's just so cool, the grace of God, and just being able to recognize it and being able, and I'm like, God, but you were there in that church. I, I know you were. I felt your spirit, and and he he said, well, this was me, and he like was, he showed me, like, this part was me, and this part was me. This part was him or them or And being able to distinguish God is God, church is church, and men are men. And that we are all, we all should wear a sign as we come into church that says, warning, Christians under construction. I love it. You you know? Yeah, I love that. Because we're here because we we need God. And we, we are under construction. And so we shouldn't expect perfection from one another we should like rejoice in how we're growing with each other and amongst each other and Mm. that we're distinguishing who God is in in every single situation and just one thing God's so cool because the first time my sons were gone and I was alone for Mother's Day with my son and um they were and I was alone for Mother's Day God did he like he knew how sad I was, and I was, uh, and they were gone. Gabriel was in a different country. Adam was in a different state, and um, and I was just talking to one of them on the phone. And just then, my little Maltese is like eight pounds. He ventured off the <laughs> deck onto the grass for the first time, and a bird like dove down and just tipped him over, and it was hilarious. And I and I thought, oh my gosh, thank you, God, you made me laugh <laughs> on on Mother's Day, you know. Yes. And anyway, he's just so cool in the little things, mm. and that's just like a little thing. Yeah. But 
I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's awesome. Alex, I think, has one. I just want to say uh, real quick, that's such an important principle, guys. If we can learn just to make room and make allowance for each other. You know, how many times have you heard someone say, well, I went to a church and they were all a bunch of hypocrites or this or that. And, and the, the sad thing is, there's parts of that that are true, or at least, and I'm not saying hypocrites, like we choose to like, let's put up a fake, you know, fake, but I just mean under construction, would you, that's absolutely 100% true. In every church, that we're gonna see things that are like, oh wow, man, that's a glimpse of Jesus. And then over here in this other thing, it's like, oh, okay, that's a little foggier. You know, we see it through a glass dimly, 1 Corinthians 13 says, then we will know fully, even as we are fully known. So making room for each other and, and recognizing, we don't have to judge a person and say, they're evil, they're a false brother or sister, they're a false pastor. We can just say, yeah, they're under construction and hey, there's some areas where I don't think, you know, they quite reflect Jesus in that area but maybe I can learn from them in this other area or I can, maybe I can help them in an area. You know, maybe God's going to use me to set them free. Like, Terry, you were talking about that background, part of my background as well. Alex. Yeah, I was seeing as the four from under and, mm -hmm. and all that as maybe a, an older or outdated. If, if I got mm. a download or some instructions from mm -hmm. God, if I'm only going off of that, it might be old right. versus yeah. if it's yeah. with God. Yeah. I have no problems with interpretation of what he's telling me now. It's like a fresh download. So mm -hmm. it's just a constant refreshing of, yeah. I want you to do this versus me looking at old instructions and trying to apply it to what mm -hmm. I should do now. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's so good. Has anybody used uh, Google Earth or the Google Street View? You know, when you have the map and then you're like, well, I want to see. I pulled it up on my house and it's literally, we have this massive tree, you know, that's probably 15 years old. And at the time, it must have been two years old. It was a little bitty tree, and the driveway was under construction. There were two big orange cones there. It was like, what? How old is that picture? But I think to your point, Alex, if we're walking with Jesus, man, we're getting live feed of what's going on, of what he wants us to see, not dating something back 15 years and us trying to go off of it. And it's awkward because, well, it didn't show a street there back then, but now it avoids a lot of confusion if we walk with him. Uh, I think you, this young man, Oh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, so to basically all four of those paradigms are essential for our walk. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. For me, the four became very dangerous. I was studying theology in school, and it became very legalistic, um, only about theology. Hindered my personal walk um, and almost came to I didn't have a walk at all. It was just all about theology. And I had to examine myself and realize that the four wasn't even really for God. It was for me and my own knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that was the scariest part for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, just losing that. So, yes, all four of those are essential for our own walk. But, yeah, like you said. You know, Absolutely it, right. It, they're, it they're, they're a part of, but in their rightful place, there can be life. When it's with, with Jesus, with God, enjoying his heart for us, enjoying his sweet company. Let me read you real quick something from that book by Sky Jathani. He said, uh, when uh, most people hear or think about God, they have a less than complete and sometimes entirely flawed vision of who he is. As a result, and I'm going to change the day to we, we do not tend to desire him. At best... We see him, sometimes, as a useful instrument for achieving something more desirous. Speaking of what the young man just shared. But if our vision were enlarged and corrected, if our vision were enlarged and corrected, if we could see his unrivaled beauty, grasp his unconditional love, perceive his radiant glory, and experience his untainted goodness then it would become obvious that he is much more than a deity to simply tolerate or a device to employ. In other words, God would cease to be how we acquire our treasure and he would become our treasure. I believe that's what God is saying. Church, I want you to get this. Get with me. Let me be your treasure. Let me be what you desire. Let me be not the means to something, but the greatest object and everything else be a means of walking together with me. I want to talk real quick about the second aspect of this. Um, and, and just for your own reflection, I'm not going to go into it now. You don't have to pull it up. But, but Revelation 21 talks about God's goal, the end of all things, and him being 
with us and being our God, wiping every tear from our eye, Revelation 22. So from the very beginning of the Garden of Eden, when he walked with the man and the woman in the cool of the day, all the way to the end of all things, when he's once again making all things new, God has not forgotten his passionate love for you. He has not for one moment forgotten how much he enjoys walking with you, hearing your thoughts, enjoying your company, and having you reciprocate and learn that as he treasures us, as we get to see that he doesn't just want to use us to get stuff done, but that he actually enjoys being with us and he treasures us, not just what we can do for him, then I think it frees us up to love him the same way, right? Because we're just loving him back the same way. We're like, well, you don't just use me to get stuff done. You love me and enjoy being with me. I love you too and enjoy being with you too. And I'm not just using you for something else. So um, thank you so much, guys, for, for sharing that. I want to talk about um, the, uh, the next thing. And that is, I believe God wants us to choke out faith with fear. He wants us to choke out faith with fear. I believe Jesus did this. And here's what's so cool. Dan and I, Pastor Dan, we're talking about uh, this message and the idea that it's interesting the relationship that love has with faith. And if you want to pull up Galatians 5 verse 6, I want you to see this really important. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts. Now, time out. When the word of God says the only thing that counts, how important is that on a scale of one to 10? 10, okay, over this section, 10, yes. The only thing that counts, what does it say? Is faith expressing itself through love. So do you see there that love and faith are deeply connected? I believe God wants us to understand that we can't fully love unless we're walking by faith, which was last week's theme. And here's why. Because I believe it's, um, um, it's, it's, it's human instinct, survival instinct, says if there are limited resources, what is my tendency going to be? I want to make sure I have enough. Any moms in the room? I want to make sure my kiddos are taken care of. Mama bear, right? And then maybe we'll see if there's enough. What happens when there is a winter storm warning here in Colorado? There's like no school. Thank you, Jesus. High five. <laughs> Extra credit there. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> what also happens besides no school? Yes, we run to the store. The, all of a sudden, all the milk gallons get taken. And, you know, I don't know. What else? What are some of the other things we get? Bread gets taken. Eggs. Nutella, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> guys, this is for free. This is not on the notes. Nutella and Fritos scoops. Just going to leave that there. That's for somebody. That's for somebody. <laughs> and you scoop the Nutella. Anyway, okay. But here's the thing. When we hear a winter... <laughs> That's some, yeah, that was for someone, but someone else was like, what in the world? <laughs> that ruined everything for me. Okay. Uh, when there's a winter storm warning, everybody rushes to get what we can because there's limited resources. They're going to be out. I got to get mine. I got to make sure our, myself or our family is protected, has enough provided for. That's logical. So how, what's God's remedy? I think because, can you see how that would limit our love for others? If love is like caring for someone, sharing my resources or my time or my affection or lo attention, listening, whatever form love might take, if I think it's limited, I'm not going to be able to love freely. 1 John 4, verse 18 says these words. I'm not sure if we got that one in there. If we didn't, it's totally my fault. Here we go. Yes. There is no fear. Say no fear. There is no fear in love. But perfect or completed love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Isn't that cool? Actually, those are two of the same verse there. So um, fear literally expels, the New Living Translation says. It expels, it evicts, excuse me, love evicts fear out of our lives. Because fear says there's not going to be enough. And if I step out in love and take a risk, I might go without. That's where faith comes in. If we draw near to God and he's telling us, I've got you, I've got you. You're my daughter. You're my son. I'm not going to let you go without. I'm going to take care of you. 
I'm going to provide for you. If, if you obey me or follow me and trust me and hear me and, and act on that and give something away or spend time with someone, or do, I got you. I know what you need. I'm not asking you to burn out. You need to hear this. We need to understand this because if we don't get this, we will not walk freely in love this year because we're going to naturally, it's not evil, we just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a survival instinct unless we step across that threshold into a supernatural life of hearing God, of walking in faith. Do you see that? Then faith expresses itself in love. Uh, uh, Bob Goff said this, when joy is a habit, love is a reflex. When joy is a habit, and I would say you could almost put faith there, when we're hearing God, when we're letting his promises fill our mind, fill our thoughts, renew our mind, then love is an instinct, or excuse me, a, a reflex. What is a reflex? It's something that your body does that doesn't even have to send the signal all the way up to the brain and back to tell it to do something. Do you understand? A reflex just goes to the spinal cord and ba-bang, right back. It's like an automatic email reply. It doesn't even have to go to the brain. Okay, this stove is hot. What should I do? Well, maybe I should take my hand off. Okay. You know, huh. No, it's like, ah, right? We don't, it didn't even get to the brain. It just, the sign up went to the spinal cord and right back until it moved. We'll figure it out all later. We'll do the paperwork later. Just get off the hot stove. <laughs> I believe God says when we're walking in faith, when we're walking in joy, love is a reflex. We begin to see little, little sparks of our behavior of caring for others begin to grow in our lives. So um, let's talk about that for a second. Um, here is something really cool that I believe, um, you know what, let me slow down. That's not what God wanted to say. Hold on. Okay. So if hearing God, if soaking in his presence, if truly walking by faith is an important aspect of love, then it makes it all the more important to figure out, okay, how am I pursuing his presence? How am I pressing in to being with him? So that then I'm released of fear to truly love freely. Listen to what Sky Jath uh, Jathani said about this. Without silence and solitude with God... And he's quoting another author named Noen. We remain unconvinced of our worth. If we don't hang out with God, the reality of our adoption, of our security, of our needs being met starts to fade and get a little fuzzy. We remain unconvinced of our worth. Instead, we will live each day striving for affirmation, praise, and success. Rather than being set free to love others, we will endlessly be seeking to prove our own value. We will labor to water our gardens by drawing buckets from the world's empty wells. In the end, this leads not to love, but to a dry and weary existence. Then he goes on to say this, when God clearly reveals himself, his beauty and his goodness, he then becomes the object of our desire rather than a means. We talked about that. But in silence and solitude, we discover something more. God delights in us too when we discover that we are his beloved children and that his joy is found not in using or controlling us as instruments of his will, but rather as the objects of his love. God is inviting us this year to pursue him in silence and in solitude. Dan Rather interviewed Mother Teresa uh, quite a few years back and uh, asked her, boy, you spend so much time in prayer. And he goes, what do you say to God during all that time? And do you know what her answer was? She goes, um, I don't actually say a whole lot. I mainly listen. And he was kind of taken aback a little bit. He's like, uh, okay, well, there went five minutes of my interview that was planned. So, uh, okay, rephrase the question. He's like, well, okay then, so what does God say to you during all that time if you spend all this time praying? And you know what she said? Not a lot. He mainly listens. I'm not sure where the interview went from there. <laughs> but isn't that interesting? Two people who love each other, choosing to come together and spend some precious moments together. But each one more intent on listening, on being dialed in to the slightest nuance of the other one's heart, of, of what's on their heart, what's on their mind, what's important to them, what they're feeling, what they're desiring what their hopes are. And then they're reflecting that right back of, but I'm listening to you. I'm, oh, are you hungry? Oh, do you want some tea? Oh, you know, what are you concerned about? Is it your grandson? Is it, is it finding a spouse? Is it your classes at school, you know? And, you know, what, what, 
what's on your heart? And you've got two people listening to each other. I believe that God is saying, I want to do that with you. And I want you to learn to trust me that way so that you're listening to me and we're, we're walking forward together. So what does this look like? How does our love grow? Um, I was talking to Cammy about this. She's the manager at uh, In Him, at the In Him store at Park Meadows. And a couple of you actually work there. I see Jamie in the room and uh, my soon-to-be daughter, Lai Marie, is somewhere in here. And, uh, but it's kind of a cool thing. They sell hoodies and clothing and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but they also ask each and every customer, hey, is there anything that we can pray with you about? Like right here and now kind of thing. <laughs> and I think some people are kind of surprised. They're like, oh, well, but, uh, no, just, you know, I'm good. Thank you. You know, they leave. But um, some people actually open up and, and give them that. And, and Cammie has learned over this last nine months that she's been working there. She's grown so much. And she'd be embarrassed me bragging on her. But I've seen her for, we've been married 28 years. And I've seen her life, just her desire to pray with others and care for people that she doesn't even know just go through the roof in nine months. Why? Only because of having an opportunity to say, God, every day, prepare my heart, Lord. I'm going to go into this situation. There's people at the mall. I don't know what's going on in their lives. I've never met them before, most of them. You know, I don't know. But God, prepare my heart to love. God, prepare my heart just to to have that mindset of giving love out. And I'm sure, Jamie, you do the same thing as you go in and Don has helped build out things for that company. You know, everyone who's a part of that, I believe that there's that sense of we can prepare our hearts to pour out seed. And I believe that when we do that, you know what's gonna happen? God is gonna begin to show us on-ramps into people's lives. You know, Cammie already has the on-ramp of asking customers if she can pray with them. But what about you and me if we don't work it in him? We're sitting here like, well, okay, I don't work there, so that's lovely for them, but what do I have? I want to tell you about Pastor Darren's dad. Um, you know, most of you know Pastor Darren. He, he teaches regularly here. He's, he's one of our formation team pastors. His dad, his name is Richard, and he lost his wife uh, just last year after, I don't know how many years were they married. Do you think 35, 40, or 25? Anyway, a long time. And as you can imagine, he's rebuilding, putting the pieces back together, figuring out, I mean, how do you, just everything changes. You know, you, you used to do certain things, have certain habits. Oh, she did this, I did this, we did this together. We did this, you know, and all of a sudden your entire routine is just turned upside down and you're like, okay, it's just me now. What do I do? As part of this sort of reinventing life and himself process, his name is Richard, he began to say, you know, what's a small way that I can show love? And the Lord put in his heart that he likes to go out to eat at least once a week to a different restaurant. And God gave him a really cool little unique idea, and that is to cut out coupons from the newspaper or find them online or whatever it might be. And maybe it's just like $2 off the salad. He goes to Chili's sometimes, and it might be, you know, buy one, get one free or whatever. So he'll go, let's say to Chili's, and when he's there, he'll look around the room. And he'll just ask God, Lord, show me who could use this coupon. And he just listens. And when he believes God is showing him someone, he'll walk over to that table and say, hey, I don't know if this would help you or not, but before the check comes, here's a, a discount coupon. And you know, it might be a couple of bucks or it might be a buy one, get one. But all of a sudden, they're thankful. They're appreciative for the most part. And he takes an opportunity to say, yeah, you know what? I used to come here all the time with my wife. She just passed away, but I just feel like this is a tiny little way that God has shown me that I can show his love to people. And before you know it, he's sharing just a seed of God's love in a very practical way. I love that. I believe God loves that. I believe God rejoices. I think God, sometimes we look at loving like it's got to be some huge thing. You know what I'm saying? I got to figure out this huge foundation to help solve all of the hunger in Africa and help, you know, you know, three billion, you know, whatever. I think God is just saying, can I just whisper to you something small? Can I just show you a creative thing? Pastor Rob's in the room. One of Rob's passions is that God wants to use us as us, right? He doesn't want you to be me. Can I hear a Hallelujah. He doesn't want, you know, me to be Rob, Rob to be Dave, Dave to be Pastor Dan, you know, whoever, you know, Elena. He has created each of us uniquely with certain gifts, 
certain personality traits, certain dislikes, certain likes, certain hobbies, certain things that come easily to us, certain things that we shy away from. God wants to use us in the middle of who we are and say, if you'll ask me, I want to show you on-ramps. Maybe it's as simple as giving somebody a $2 off for their meal coupon. There's a group of ladies that came into NHIM with Cammie, and um, they, um, they said, you know, this time of year, there's about 12 of them, we get together, and we decide upon a restaurant, maybe like a, like a waffle house or kind of a, not a high-end restaurant, you know, but, and we pray beforehand about how much God wants each of us to tip the server. And then we come ready to do that. And she came in in December to Enham and shared this story with Kim. She was so excited she could barely hold herself back. She said, we went in and we went to, let's say it was a Waffle House and there was a single mom who was a server. And when time came for the check, we all asked each other, what did God speak? And we tallied that up. And the tip was $1,217. And you know what the cool thing was? I mean, that was cool. But what was also cool, it was December 17th. And she was like, I can't believe this. Like God just kind of like giving his little kiss like, you guys are hearing me. Each one separately a certain amount. But when it came together, it was 12-17. And that was exactly the date. Now, whatever, maybe you're like, ah, who cares? Or that's a coincidence. It doesn't matter. I'm not trying to make a big deal. But, but isn't that, I, I just believe that shows God just wanting to say, I'm so excited that you're asking me for on-ramps to love people. That you're asking me just to do something that makes sense to you. Maybe the person next to be like, that's silly or that, I, wow, really? I don't know why you would do that. But to you, it brings life. To you, it's like, yes, I can be a vessel of God's love in some way. Give me a coupon giving a tip. There's a missionary, uh, Pastor Stephen, who's the associate over at Plum Creek. His dad passed away last year. He was a missionary for years, even when he retired, said that he would always ask the server at a restaurant, hey, we're getting ready to pray for our meal, but we'd love to include you. Is there anything going on in your life that we could take a minute to pray for? Can you imagine? Like, and maybe they say no sometimes. That's fine. We're not trying to, you know, bash people with the, the Bible or whatever, but how cool that somebody would feel like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm going through something. You'd be surprised at how people's hearts can just melt when they're touched with the love of Jesus through us. The Rock Church is hosting uh, a, a movie night uh, showing uh, Unplanned. And they're also going to have a number of ministries there that represent help to single moms and people that are in trouble and discouraged and needing resources. And that's gonna be uh, Sunday night, the 26th of this month. And we're encouraging you to go if you wanna, to be a part of that. But what a cool thing, you know, something that can start so small and tiny is a little coupon. I believe that what we see in our life is that love grows, doesn't it? It's like a little seed. It's kind of like the kingdom of God. It's a little seed. We plant it. We don't really understand what all happens under the surface, but all of a sudden before we know it, it's becoming this huge thing, or like yeast. You put a teeny bit in the dough and you mix it up together, and all of a sudden, right? And here in Colorado, high altitude, we experience that with uh, some cornbread. Let's not talk about it. So hey, I'm going to close. I just wanted to ask uh, real quick, let's, let's talk about this real quick. What is uh, something that, in fact, Dan, what would be a discussion question that would or Rob, or anybody, does anybody have a discussion question, something that, that would activate what has God been speaking to us in terms of just taking that with love with the Father, but how does that play out in our lives? Can you think of anything? I don't mean to, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> but Dan is so great at this. Pastor Dan is an awesome question, discussion asker. So you can think about it if you think of something. Okay, no worries. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Dan is literally a master at this, so... Um, what is something that, that you've seen God spark in you or that you've been a recipient of maybe, of just his love in a seemingly, but maybe it's a small thing, but it meant something to you. You felt loved by Jesus through someone. Oh, over here, yeah. One thing that I think about is like, for instance, there was this one guy that came up to me in Walmart and he was talking to me in the hardware area. 
and sometimes I like to get in and get out, and he, it was going on and on and on. But I honestly felt like the Lord was saying, hey, remember the scripture that talks about entertaining angels? Mm -hmm. And so for us to just be patient, you know, because he was an elderly person, and, you know, he probably needed some company mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that, too. Yeah. So I just think that's just such a great way to show the love of God is just to listen. And I love it, that. It comes out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so good. So good. Somebody else? Over here, Rob. I was just thinking my dad's in the hospital this week. He had a stroke. And um, every nurse that takes time to talk to me and they're not rushed in and out of the room, I feel the love of God. Mm -hmm. When they're talking to me or listening to my dad, and I kind of dismissed a couple doctors. I was like, guys, he's going to talk and talk to you. So if you have to go, please feel free to go. But they didn't. And they just sit there and they listen. And to me, that's the love of God in this rush, rush, hurry, hurry society, myself included. Like, I really struggle with that. Just when anybody pauses and listens and slows their life down, for me, I feel really blessed by that. Awesome. Kind of a cool testimony here. Um, my grandmother is in a nursing home, and she's kind of not doing too well with memory and stuff. Um, and then back in November, I was t diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Um, and at that time, I was always just on my heart, go see grandma, go see grandma, go see grandma, and just pray with grandma, you know. But I could never do it. And come to find out, I go to my first diabetes appointment, and it's the next door to my grandma. Oh my so every wow. time I go to my diabetes appointments, which I absolutely despise, obviously, I go right after to see my grandma. Mm. And the first time I ever did this, one of the ladies in there who was washing my grandmother was wearing an agape love shirt, and I just broke. Mm. And I just sat with my grandma and just prayed with her and cried with her the very first time I ever went to my diabetes appointment. So just in a little reminder yeah. for me, I was yeah. just like, wow, it's right here by my grandma. Let me run over there. Yeah. And the lady was wearing an agape love shirt. So mm. yeah, just encouraging for me. So good. Way to recognize that on-ramp, you know, of God just making it easy. Like, here it is. Go see her. Oh, over here, yeah. I think just like any time anytime in my whole life that somebody has like prayed a verse over me or just given me an actual like specific, I don't know, like I feel like the Lord put this on my heart and like here's a verse to, you know, for you. Like it's something I pay a lot of attention to. It's a way that I feel like God speaks to me for other people as well. And so just I think like specifically like reading reading the word of God and asking asking God for, for other people, is this verse for me, or is, th is this maybe something I could, like, you know, like, what is it that I could sow back into your world from your word, so. So good. That's great. Praise God. I think for me, as far as, like, a question, I feel like the Lord has been asking me, at least this year, um, is just, are you available? Like, are you available for God to use you? And even, like, the little things that maybe are seem like an inconvenience. Um, if somebody comes up to you or a stranger wants to talk randomly for hours, like, are you available? Like, are you allowing God to use you, or are you too rushed in life to listen? No, you're great. You, you contribute good stuff, Terry. <laughs> Just a quick little um, thing. Back on uh, at the Christmas program, Jesus showed me his love through somebody who handed me an ink pen that said, make every day count. Wow. So <laughs> Is that Dave back there? <laughs> no, no. That's so great. Well, guys, I obviously we could, we could talk all day. I know that the, the, the ideas that God is sparking inside of us I think are, are endless. God is giving, and even now I just believe that he's, he's whispering creative ideas that make sense to you, that, that work with who you are, who he's wired you to be. And if we'll just recognize those little things and be bold and step out, recognize that his resources are unlimited, that he's got our back, that as we step out in faith and hear him and walk in his love, he's gonna replenish we're going to be able to connect other people to his pipeline. I believe it's going to be incredible to see what God's going to do this year. So let's pray together as we close. God, thank you so much for your endless love in our lives. 
Thank you that you're a God who's called us to be with you and you delight in being with us. Lord, I pray that our eyes would be open. I pray that you would reconfigure those of us that, that even the enemy has used a good thing of living for you or from you or over you, under you. But Lord, I pray that you would realign us to see that it all flows from your desire to be with us and for us to be with you. And that all the other things will, will take their proper place. Establish that in us. Let us be people who love you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. Let us be people who love our neighbor. So many neighbors in every day that each of us comes in contact with us. Let us be vessels of your love so that people would see you and turn to you and love you, give you praise. Bless your people. Encourage each one in Jesus' name. Amen.